going. So welcome everybody to our uh, next podcast, our latest podcast, uh, Moving Into the Unknown. And we're, we're delighted today and we'd like to welcome uh, Deborah Bowes. And uh, we're very excited to have Deborah here today. She lives in San Francisco and she's a, a renowned Feldenkrais Christ practitioner, teacher and trainer, having been in private practice actually for 34 years, uh, which, is, which is quite amazing. She initially trained as a, as a physical therapist at Columbia University in New York and later earned a doctorate in physical therapy uh, in Virginia. As a Guild certified trainer of the Feldenkrais Method since 2000, she's taught widely in the United States, Canada, Germany, Sweden, Australia and Colombia for 14 different training organisations and in over 32 training programs. Deborah's other related in-depth studies and practices include Tai Chi, Chuan, Qigong, Yoga, Sensory Awareness, Meditation and Dance. Deborah co-founded the San Francisco Feldenkrais Centre for Movement and Awareness in 1988. And for the past 34 years, she has provided Feldenkrais lessons, classes and workshops for adults and children. She's made many presentations and trainings to professional organisations, university programs, hospitals and other professional groups. She is an adjunct faculty member of Saybrook University teaching movement modalities and wellness. Her doctoral research demonstrated the benefit of her original Feldenkrais Method program, Pelvic Health and Awareness for Women and Men for Improving Pelvic Floor Health. Overall, Deborah is a highly respected Feldenkrais elder, and as she has contributed greatly to the ongoing development of the method, we're delighted and excited to be talking with Deborah today. So welcome, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Yeah, it's great to be here. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful, wonderful to have you here. So, Deborah, um, look, you've had a you know a very long history in the with Feldenkrais. So, we, we're very curious about. Um, could you tell us how you first became involved in Feldenkrais, please? Yeah, so that that was so long ago. But so I used to live in New York City. Before that, I lived in Rhode Island, and then. You know, I, I actually rode my bicycle to San Francisco from Boston. And when I got here to San Francisco, then I needed a place to live. And um, there was a place you went to called Roommate Referral, and they do it on the internet now. But then there were these books, and you looked through the books. And I went to visit one place where Mark Reese lived. So I became a roommate of Mark Reese. And during that summer, that I uh, moved in, Mark was doing an advanced training at that time with Moshe Feldenkrais. He, they'd already finished the San Francisco training. So Feldenkrais was there, whom I never met, but Mark had just finished the advanced training and Dennis Leary was living there and David Burson would come over. And so that's how I first heard about Feldenkrais. And I would walk around and I would see these flyers, you know, on, on the telephone poles. Um, there's some funny sound happening. Okay. So I would see these signs on the telephone poles, like Feldenkrais, and I wondered what the heck that was. And then Mark uh, organized a uh, workshop for uh, Gabi Yaron and Mia Siegel. And I went to some of those classes. And Mark used to teach a class in our house, in the living room. And there were a lot of there were poets that came, like kind of well-known people who came. And I, I actually didn't know what the heck was going on <laughs> at all. But I became very interested in the ideas and especially um, one idea of Moshe Feldenkrais where he said, I'm not only interested in flexible bodies, I'm interested in flexible minds. And I felt like my mind was in like a box and um, I didn't know really how to think. I had been a science major in college and I 
I knew how to take multiple choice tests. I knew how to memorize. I knew how to be very linear. Uh, but I didn't know how to do the kind of associative thinking that I was, uh, the conversations that I was sitting in on with Dennis and Mark and, uh, and David. So uh, that's how I became involved. I really, I wanted that mind to change. I wanted my mind to uh, expand because I was young. I didn't have any injuries. I didn't have any uh, difficulties at the time, except for mental and emotional difficulties, but physical difficulties <laughs> I didn't have. So that's how I became in, involved. And then later after that, then I was roommates with Dennis Leary and Dennis would run his Feldenkrais practice also out of the house. And we became very, very good friends. And then Dennis started talking to me about the next training that was going to happen. That was the Amherst training, but I had a child. I, I just couldn't imagine going. And then after that, Dennis told me there's going to be a training in San Rafael. And by this time I was ready. And I just really wow. wanted to do it for myself. I never thought I would practice. I just wanted that experience, that personal experience and that ability to feel better in my own, in my own brain. Wow. So it's, so it's been, it's been quite a journey for you. And, mm -hmm. and did you, did you notice that you felt better in your own brain? Oh yeah. I remember the day it happened. So yeah. in a training, right, you're doing multiple awareness, the movement lessons. And there's one lesson where I just felt my brain explode and I was never the same after that. And this was a lesson where you're lying on your back, your knees are bent, and basically you're moving your pelvis in a circle. So it's kind of like a pelvic clock. You're moving your pelvis in the circle, you're sensing the weight shift on the floor. Then your attention is directed to the circles that your knees are making. So you have those two areas. Then you start directing your attention to the circle in the back of your head, and then the circle of your nose. And then you start doing your eyes in the same direction. And then you switch your eyes to the opposite direction. And then you start doing your hand in this very, very slow opening and closing. And at that point, I realized how much I always wanted to be in control, right? Like conscious control. And at that point, in order to do all those things and pay attention to all those places, there was another level of um, experience that happened that wasn't conscious control, but, and I really, I felt my brain kind of just, I don't know how to describe it. It was like a fireworks explosion in my brain and I could do it and I felt amazing. And then after that, I had many, many um, new experiences of thinking that I could do associative thinking that I could, uh, hold both yes and no in my head that I didn't always have to know. I just want to know exactly what someone means. Um, I could understand metaphor, which I had a lot of trouble with understanding metaphor. Um, and I loved poetry and the sound of poetry. But I, part of me always wanted to know, like, what the heck are you saying? Why don't you just say it, right? So that happened after my brain exploded <laughs> that I just had a whole different experience of being a human being. And um, then I, I got what I wanted and I just continued. So it, it almost sounds like there was a quite an emotional transformation there. So what I heard was that you, it, it, in a way, it helped you let go of, of having that need to be in control, that you could actually just allow the process to, to unfold in a way. Is that... Yeah, I would say that's true. There was another experience I had where we were lying on our side and imagining we had uh, some crayons in our hand and we could draw on the floor with these imaginary crayons and draw as big as we wanted. And I remember being very proud of myself as like a smart person and doing very well in school. But when I looked around, I saw like, I was drawing this very small area. And other people were so creative in drawing big, giant areas. And I realized, wow, I'm putting myself in a box. Like, I always thought other people were putting me in a box. But no, I'm putting myself in the box. Yeah. So that was the, um, that was a big creative transformation. And I, then I started to question everything about myself. So in fact, what you're talking about there then is you're talking about a thinking process, you're talking about a feeling process, but it sounds like you're also talking about a behavioral process. Exactly. So you started to behave differently 
towards yourself and then I imagine in the world. Towards others. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which, is a, which is a beautiful thing, I think, about, about Feldenkrais. It does give us those opportunities. Um, right. So, so over so many years of practice, you must have some real standout experiences of, of both, well, you've mm -hmm. talked about personally, your experiences, but, but also um, of client client changes and and aha moments or or things that have happened for them that's changed their life um are there any that really stand out for you that you'd like to share or that you think are, are, are worthy i'm sorry i put you on the spot there having to think of an example yeah yeah no 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 it's okay um i mean there's so many so generally what happens is that people always feel better physically. I mean, now at the level that I'm at, at the experience that I have, people feel better physically, whatever it is that they've come up for. Then they start to become aware of what they're doing. And then people start reporting like, I'm gonna quit my job, right? Or my marriage isn't working and I wanna do something about that. Or I'm gonna be nicer to my kids. And then they, this kind of spark of curiosity is evoked in them, again, about every aspect of their life. So, I mean, one experience I had very recently was a young man who was in his early 20s, and he had, um, as a child, cerebral palsy. And he was very high functioning. You know, he just kind of had a limp and funny way of using his leg. And he wanted to be able to get down to the floor without falling down. And that's what we worked on. How he could develop this ability to, from standing to just bend down and put his hands on the floor and sit on the floor without falling. And he had an incredible transformation with that. We laughed a lot. He was very open. He got down on the floor eventually so well that he started going to yoga classes every morning at 6 a.m. And he started <laughs> doing things like skydiving and drone photography. I mean, he's an amazing young man. And also through that, he was involved with a college program that was really restricting him as an artist. And uh, he quit college and is now doing amazing stuff. And walks better, he's run um, a five kilometer race, all, all from this simple thing of learning how to get on the floor, right? Which also included everything about his, his self image. So that was one. And then if I have time for one more story, so this was a guy I saw, a man, yep. he was in his seventies and he had sleep apnea. So, you know, he couldn't sleep very well and he was always stopping breathing. So they gave him uh, a machine to help him breathe, but it consisted of these two cannulas that you put in your nose and it would push air into your lungs at night. And the reason he was referred to me was not because of that. Well, it was because he had incredible back pain, especially the thoracic spine, the upper back pain. And he'd had all these tests. And this was at Stanford University, you know, a fancy big time, probably the most, one of the most prestigious hospitals in the country. Um, so he'd had all kinds of tests, saw all kinds of specialists. And no one asked him like, well, when did this pain start? The pain started when he was given these things because his rib cage was so stiff. He didn't have the movement to accommodate this extra expansion. So his lungs are being pushed full of air, which was pushing against the ribs and, and there was a conflict going on. So he, it was very easy. I think it was like two or three sessions of teaching him about the idea of the rib movement, rib mobility, getting, helping him touching along the ribs and the spine to get that mobility. And his pain completely went away. I mean, such a simple thing, right? Such a simple thing. So yeah. those were two pretty extraordinary experiences. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, there are a lot of simple things, it seems, or, or, or you know, in the, in the Feldenkrais method that help people enormously. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so they're, they're great. Thank you very much for sharing those stories. And I'm sure that you've got many others. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're going to be here all night or all day. <laughs> so you've also, um, well, you've studied pelvic health in depth and its connection with Feldman Cross. Um, but you've also, it seems you've, you've focused as a bit of a, maybe a bit of a speciality or you're quite well known for your work in terms of pelvic health. And, and the pelvic floor. Um, would you like to just talk a little bit about the work that you've done in that area? And um, Sure, yeah. and this relates, to, this relates to Australia. So oh, you know, I'm married to an Australian, Cliff Smythe. And when I, when I met Cliff um, and I went to Australia the first time, I met Barbara Bell and well, and Judy Pippin. I actually met Judy Pippin. And I learned of their work with the pelvic floor. And I had been really troubled with urinary incontinence. I mean, bad incontinence. Like I couldn't, I was only 42, I think then or something. I couldn't run for the bus or dancing at a party. It would be horrible, you know, embarrassing um, wow. leakage. Yeah. So I did their lessons and then I became very interested in how can I grow that material a little bit more. And um, then I started an intensive study. So I studied with the phys physical therapist in the Women's Physical Therapy Association. I took courses with them. I started reading research articles and then I designed a program for myself to cure my incontinence. And I did. I could then be on a trampoline jumping and realize like, oh my God, I'm jumping and I have to pee and nothing's coming out. This is amazing. So then I wanted to share it. And, uh, but I wasn't, I didn't have any confidence. Like, is this really something? So I met uh, in a training that I was teaching in, in Baltimore, I met Laura Schuffel, who is a physical therapist, a women's health physical therapist. And I showed her my program and she was like, this is amazing. This is really great. So Laura and I did some teaching together. And then I eventually, when I did my, um, my doctorate, I did the doctorate in order that I could do a research. I would be pushed to do a research project to see if Feldenkrais, my Feldenkrais lessons could help with urinary incontinence, you know, and in research thing, you got to really narrow it because it helps with lots of other things, constipation, women reported, uh, improvement in their hands, uh, women were able to go in the car for a two hour drive instead of having to stop every half hour to pee. I mean, it was, it was liberating, improved sexual function. So um, I continue to develop that work. And this past year during COVID, I've taught two really intensive programs one developing uh, awareness of the pelvic floor and then the next one about developing power. So the crux of it is, and because the old way of working with pelvic floor and especially incontinence, which was my big desire to improve, was to just contract the pelvic floor muscles like Kegels, if you know what a Kegel is, just contract Kegels. I had been doing like, I don't know, 150, 200 kegels a day and was still incontinent. So then as I thought about, well, what about with Feldenkrais? And then I started reading and really studying Moshe's lessons. And he often mentions, do you feel something between the legs? I was like, ah. And then the women I studied with kept stressing, it's you, the abdominals are part of this system. And not only the abdominals, but the abdominals, the deep muscles of the back, the breathing that everything is coordinated. You can't just isolate a movement. And I realized that I had been trying to just isolate this one muscle group that never really works alone. It always works with its friend and it's supported by a lot of research that comes out of the lab in Australia with Paul Hodges, um, where they have been investigating for many years about back pain. And then I had women come to me and say, uh, my sacroiliac joint is out of whack. And I'd say, how do you know? And they'd say, because I'm leaking urine. And I was like, whoa, what does that have to do with it? So my, my style of life is that 
I attack something I don't know and I just go crazy researching it. So I developed, you know, a whole approach using ideas from Feldenkrais. But the main one is if you can't feel your pelvic floor, you can't improve it. So how can I help people feel it? And if you feel it, you can improve it. So all of my lessons are about developing awareness. And in order to develop awareness of the pelvic floor, you have to develop awareness of movement through the whole body because the pelvic floor is involved in movement of the whole body. So that was my, that's my unique, I think, uh, contribution to that uh, whole area. Um, and I think, you know, you have, you seem to have a real art or a real ability to, to make things reachable, to make them simple, to make them accessible and to make them very usable for people. Um, and we, we have had a few people that have shown interest actually in the, the whole pelvic health area, but one of our listeners uh, actually asked what your thoughts were, um, if you would, on the relationship between the pelvis, the pelvic floor, uh, the jaw and the palate. Is that something yeah. that you could, you could talk about? Well, not the palate. It's, it's very interesting. I don't know a lot about the palate. Well, but certainly the yeah. jaw, right? So when you're in labor, and the midwife will often say, relax the jaw to relax the pelvic floor. And, you know, if this is the beginning of the whole tube <laughs> up here, and the pelvic floor is the ending of the whole tube, there's going to be some relationship. I, um, I'm not an expert on, on that, but I have developed lessons that connect the jaw to the pelvis, right? That any area of the body can be affected by excess tone, right? By stress that you get tight. So the jaw, the breathing, the pelvic floor are three areas, especially that will get really tight when people are stressed. If you do the pelvic floor work that I've developed, your jaw will be more relaxed. And if you do the jaw lessons, your pelvic floor will be relaxed. So like David Burson and Mark Reese did a series um, originally called uh, Sensory Motor Integration for the Mouth and Jaw, which they then turned into TMJ Health, kind of a little shortened versions. Uh, but in sensory motor integration for the mouth and jaw, one of their lessons is working with the jaw and the pelvis. So I kind of stole from, <laughs> from everybody and experimented over and over with my own body. So there's, that was an influence. Uh, Ruthie Alon did a series called Sphincters, which that doesn't really do what I do. And then there's Judy Pippins and uh, Barbara Bell's lessons, uh, Pelvic Power. I studied with uh, Eric Franklin, who uses uh, imagery and tried to bring the imagery into the, the pelvic floor. So my lessons combine a lot of that imagery, uh, movement, uh, certainly the breath. And layered in on it are these values. So the values of being curious, the values of being kind to yourself and um, the values of like learning from your experience. So all of that is kind of woven together in a way. And then I continue to develop and whenever someone says, oh, they teach pelvic floor, then I, I take their class and I say, well, what are you offering, right? Is there something that I can learn from this? Um, so I did something with some dancers and that helped me develop more lessons that were about standing in the pelvic floor. Um, all taught, right, from a Feldenkrais pedagogy. So not like, please do this and do it like this and don't do it any other way, but really with the exploration, lots of variation, rest, um, reflection, all of these things that we do in Feldenkrais uh, offer a perfect way to get some sensation down there where for women, it's very hard to feel that. That's amazing, that area of pelvic health. And thank you so much for sharing that. Um, you've also got quite a, an, your other area that I see is, is chronic pain. 
-hmm. And you've just, this year has been a chapter that you've written called Combining Feldenkrais Method with Positive Psychology to Promote a Positive Orientation Towards Living with Pain. Um, so that's in the book, The Feldenkrais Method, Learning Through Movement. Can you speak to about um, people's self-image when they've got chronic pain and what that does to their self-image? Right. Wow, that's a deep one. Um, I love working with people with chronic pain. So as soon as you say that, you get some attention, right? Because most practitioners, especially physical therapists, it's like, whoa, I don't know what to do with that person. And that's why they don't like it because they don't know what to do. I know a process, you know the same process, a process of paying attention, a process of self-observation. And so that's what I teach. I teach people this process and any lesson can help. Some lessons are more useful, like any lesson that connects the pelvis and the head um, will be more useful in the beginning because that's one of the fundamental movement connections. But what you ask about self-image? So the way I put it is, you know, Feldenkrais talked about self-image as having four components, moving, sensing, feeling, and thinking. And when I had chronic pain myself, I mean, most of my discoveries are about helping myself. <laughs> so when I had chronic pain myself, I noticed that my sensing, all I was sensing was, does it hurt? Doesn't it hurt? I was very binary. Hurt, no hurt. Hurt, no hurt. Um, my feelings were pretty much in the negative feeling area. Depression, sense of isolation, fear, uh, anxiety. So that's uh, sensing and feeling. Moving, I had, I was a big mover. That's been my life as a mover. And I was hardly moving at all and I was really afraid to move. And thinking, my thinking was like, how can I get out of this? This is horrible. It was really negative. So one day a friend asked me, hey, how have you been doing? And what I did was just talk about how much pain I was having. And he said, that's actually not what I asked you. I asked you, how are you doing? And I realized like, oh my God, I'm doing it too. I'm just like, the only way I think about myself or feel is like, do I hurt or don't I hurt? So the way I describe it is that then people get into a very small um, circle of self-image. And I try to enlarge each one of those areas. So if you're sensing just, does it hurt, doesn't it hurt? There's so many other sensations that we could feel, the sense of breathing, the sense of pressure, the sense of comfort, the sense of space. Um, for feelings, I, I include in the lessons, looking for the feeling of pleasure, right? Pleasure is like the dopamine um, highway. When you have pleasure, you get a little shot of dopamine and that dopamine is one of our natural chemicals that makes us feel good. And in thinking, the thoughts, the, the pain psychologists call it catastrophizing, right? Like that you feel pain and immediately you've gone, what I call, you've jumped on the zip line to hell. And you jump on that zip line and you zoom down there and in the cave of hell is like, no one will love me. I'm no good. This is terrible. What's going to happen? And I ask people to become aware of when they jump on that zip line and let go, right? Don't go there. Just notice like, oh, I have pain now. What can I do now? And that goes into the moving part, right? So I have, I, I, I think like there's five, there's more, but I use these five areas of the body that, um, have more representation in the sensory motor cortex. And so if you want to affect the whole brain, use one of these five areas and you're going to get more bang for your buck. So one of the areas are the hands. So I ask people, what are you doing with your hands? And generally when someone has pain who hasn't been, you know, trained or self-aware, they're going to be, there's some, there's something happening in the hand. So just relax your hand. And I ask people to do things like, you know, 
what I call vampire hands, doing with vampire hands or, or conducting the wind with your hands. Something really soft and light with your hand is going to relax the whole brain. The other one is the eyes. What are you doing with your eyes? You know, and the eyes are the windows to the soul, right? The eyes are just little buds of the brain. So ask people to notice what they're doing with their eyes and move your eyes around, right? Because often people with chronic pain, as soon as they have pain, their eyes will stare and they'll fixate on one thing. So just blink your eyes, look around. So that's the hands and eyes. Then, then there's the breath, right? What are you doing with your breath? Here comes my cat. <laughs> so um, what are you doing with your breath? Because if you're holding your breath, you're just making the pain worse. So can you breathe? Then, ah, then there's the feet. What are you doing with your feet? And the feet are the same thing, right? The feet are always active, keeping our balance. So asking people to relax the toes, wiggle the toes. And then the last thing I um, do is where's your support, right? Because we need skeletal support. So if I'm sitting, my support is my pelvis. If I'm standing, it's the feet. If I'm lying, it's my whole uh, back of myself. And I ask that question like that, what are you doing with support? Both as like physical support, but it also brings with it all of these connections in your mind about support. Like, what do you need for support? You need people who support you. You need financial support. You need emotional support. So that's it. Hands, feet, eyes, breath, and support. And I teach people to use these questions. Every time you have pain, go through them. Boom, 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 boom. And that will cause a change in your whole self-image. And you can start to expand your self-image so that you can move from this place of I can't to I can. And, and everyone can move their eyes, right? When I worked in a pain program um, where there was people who were injured on the job and had no objective findings. But I always used to say to the two doctors, I worked with a psychologist and a doctor who was a psychologist. And I would say, did you touch them? <laughs> Those are objective findings to me. Like they're like, ah, so, so toned. And, um, and one of the entries for that group of people was doing eye lessons in whatever comfortable position it was, right? Lying down or sitting or on their side, it didn't matter. That was a class that I could teach beginning with the eyes or beginning with breath. And then um, it would drastically reduce pain. And then it would take about four days. And by the fourth day, everybody was like, I don't know, eating out of the palm of my hand. Like, then, then they were like feeling confident that they could do more things um, because it's so depressing to have chronic pain and no sense. Like I always ask people when they come, so what is the one thing you can do right when you have chronic pain? What is one thing that you can do uh, to feel better? And if someone says nothing, I'm gonna put the cat down. <laughs> and if someone says nothing, that's so sad. I feel just like, wow, what is that life like? You have this pain and you can't do a thing. So I try to enlarge what people can do, which might include the five questions or would include the five questions. It might include taking a bath. It might include listening to music. It might include looking outside at the clouds. It might include taking a pain med, right? That people need more and more tools. And then with awareness, they can begin to uh, understand, well, which tool would I use now, right? So everybody can have more and more, more tools. And, um, and that's why I've been hired for several pain programs to develop them and to teach these, this process, right? Because one of the things as a physical therapist is that, <laughs> that I experienced anyway, which is that I had to know a lot, right? If people didn't get better, I felt like, oh my God, it's my fault. I just don't know enough. If only I knew more. I, but now I realize that no, what I really, really know is this process of self-discovery and self-observation. And all of us can teach anyone else 
how to observe the self. And then we have these other skills of movement and blah, 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 blah. But the biggest thing is getting people engaged in the process of curiosity about themselves and how they can, what they can do. Right? I can do 40% of it. They can do 60% of it. I think that's so empowering for everyone listening, especially for me, you know, as people coming out as new practitioners or, and, mm -hmm. and the idea of chronic pain, it almost, it, it's such a stuck condition, um, you know, emotionally and mentally that, as you said, you love, you know, you know where to go, but if we, right. we know Feldenkrais, we all know where to go. It's just um, using the resources correctly, like, yeah, in that process. So that's quite empowering to hear you say that because I think there is a fear that, oh, we need to do more lessons, we need to know more anatomy, we need to, that you sort of, and I guess it's refreshing for you to say that after so much experience, we know the process so we can still do that as well. Right, yeah, so the trick is with someone with chronic pain, when they first come in, and you, when you first touch them, that is a magic moment, right? That they realize like, cause they're expecting something very different. <laughs> yeah. 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 They're expecting to be hurt. So to really, when once a Yohanan Ryerant, he, he gave a talk at a conference and you know, he was a, ex, one of the experienced students with Moshe. He, he unfortunately has passed on now, but Yohanan said the number one thing is to reassure the limbic system. And I wondered, what does that mean? I mean, I didn't, when I hear something that I don't understand, then I start doing my research, right? So then I realized like everything we do in Feldenkrais reassures the limbic system. The limbic system is what's always on. Is this dangerous or not? So when we first touch the person, it's so loving and gentle. Our table is low. They just sit on it. They don't have to be upon a high, narrow little treatment table. People wear their ordinary clothes. We work in a very calm environment. And we have the personal experience of being a beginner in learning. So I feel like Feldenkrais is a natural limbic system, right, assurance. And uh, I really do that. And so I try like the first time I touch them, everything I do, I want to make sure if, I, if anything hurts, I say, oh, thank you. Thank you for telling me that right? Really help that person feel like you are so safe here. You've never been this safe. And that really then starts somebody wondering like, well, what else do you know? <laughs> right? What else have you, can you teach me? And then, then I know like, oh, well, we can go places now. And I guess when you've said that, it, it reminded me you've, you in your article about um, that pain can be interpreted with danger and that the difference between chronic, chronic and acute pain. Right. Can you explain that relationship a little bit more? Yeah, so chronic pain, well, I mean, people can have chronic pain for a lot of th reasons. And sometimes it is because there is, it's dangerous for what they're doing. But it's still the research and the science about it is developing. But what can happen is that the, it's described sometimes like a symphony like pain is a pattern in the nervous system and chronic pain can be set off by thinking, sensing, feeling, or moving. And um, it doesn't mean that something bad is happening to you, that you're damaging yourself. And if you can disconnect that, like really separate from that, like, cause people often use the language like, oh, I'm all flared up. No, you're not flared up. Maybe you had a fight with your sister right? Maybe you're worried about paying a bill. Maybe somebody has been mean to you, or maybe you took the garbage out too, too many times, right? So I ask people to go through those things. Was it something you sensed? Was it something you felt? Was it something you thought or something you did? It's almost never something someone did. And that is a really hard thing to kind of get people to buy into because they think, often like, oh, well, then you think my pain's not real. It's like, no, no, I know your pain is real, but we're just looking like, what set it off? Did the violin start or was it the percussion or was it, right, the, 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 uh, the horns? Like any one of these things can set off that pattern. And, and if someone will accept 
that there is this possibility, then there are ways to interact with the pattern and interrupt the pattern. Like for example, the five questions, you'll interrupt your pattern and your pain will change. And I discovered all this because in 1992, I had a head on car crash. I herniated five discs in my neck. I was in so much pain. Oh gosh. I didn't work for a year and a half. My arms were numb, my, my whole body. I stopped going to Feldenkrais practitioners because I felt judged. I felt judged by, if you only weren't so messed up, you wouldn't be in this condition. It's like, yeah, exactly. Um, and I realized that we do get trained to judge, but we're judging movement. We're judging qualities of movement, but that judgment was transferred to judging me as a person. And it was not helpful. So I went to an acupuncturist, an osteopath. I went to a movement specialist, a yoga specialist. And I just did a lot of ATM. That's where I really like valued the learning from ATM because um, there was something about Feldenkrais. Nobody talked about pain then. If you, if you search Moshe's books, he doesn't mention pain. He'll say, you know, do these things without pain and all of that stuff. But as far as what to do with someone with pain, I couldn't really, I haven't found anything. Self-image always. So then I started to think, well, what about self-image and pain? Like, how can I work with, with self-image? Because that self-image, if you improve someone's ability to sense, feel, think, and move, you're going to improve their ability to have more and more tools for chronic pain. And I never promise you'll be free of chronic pain. We're humans, you're probably gonna have pain. And if you've had serious injuries, I still have pain, but I don't no longer, mostly don't get freaked out by it, right? I know like, oh, lie down. Oh, listen to music. Oh, put your legs up, you know? Oh, uh, one nice thing is also breathing some scents like lavender or lemon, right? Because the smells immediately interrupt the pattern. Yeah, so that's how uh, I started teaching about pain and reading about pain. And now, you know, these ideas about acute and chronic pain are kind of in the culture. Acute pain is, you know, you break your leg and you shouldn't weight bear on it. Listen to that. <laughs> but, you know, when the leg is healed and you're still not able to weight bear, then it's possible that you'll actually have changes in your nerves, in your neurotransmitters, in your brain that make the pain come on that is unrelated to damaging yourself. So, so once again, Deborah, I think what you're demonstrating is, is your ability to, in a way you pioneered it, um, working with people with chronic pain, but also making it accessible, making it tangible and I think, you know, I certainly really appreciate those areas that you've talked about in terms of tools for people working with chronic pain. But something else that, that I, uh, I noticed you'd written about in the chapter in the, in the Feldenkrais book was, um, it was around the, I think it was in the chapter in the book, the, the central nervous, because you've written quite a lot, of, a lot of stuff, but a lot of material, but it was around uh, where people have a disorder uh, in their nervous system and you talked about uh, fostering curiosity. And I know that that's, you know, that's something that's really important within the Feldenkrais method. But could you talk a little bit about that, please, in terms of how yeah. that's helpful for people? Yeah, so everything I, that I teach, I really have been using Feldenkrais's words. So pain, chronic pain, is considered a disease of the nervous system. Like the nervous system is out of whack. You know, and yeah. we still don't know how to really work with chronic pain, like chemically or, you know, now there's ideas about ketamine or psychedelics, like how to affect the nervous system. But I can accept that chronic pain becomes a disease of the nervous system. And then Feldenkrais says the nervous system does three things. It gives us information about ourselves, about our body, right? Are we hot, cold, balanced, whatever. It gives us information about the environment and it gives us the curiosity to do those first two things. 
So when I thought about that, I thought like, wow, then the curiosity is the most important part, right? A healthy nervous system means that person is curious. And when I've worked with people with chronic pain, I can tell how long I'm going to have to see them by how curious they are. So people who come who just want me to fix them, I actually cannot fix you. <laughs> That's not something I do. And I have to say that like, no, I don't fix people, but I can help you discover what you need to do to feel better. So curiosity and discovery, and curiosity is a major part of every awareness and movement lesson, right? How is that happening? How is the weight shifting? Where are you looking? Um, what is the quality of the movement? So that's where that comes from, straight out of Moshe's mouth about curiosity. And um, so a lot of my early classes about pain were called pain and curiosity. And so like working with the person for the Feldenkrais practitioners who are here listening, if you can, f if you can discover something that person doesn't know about themselves, whoa, you've got them. So I think of the cardinal movements of the spine. So shifting the weight left and right, side bending one way or the other, uh, flexing and extending the spine uh, and turning, right? Turning the spine and weight shift. And I try to discover a habit that the person has. Everyone's got one. So the easiest one is which side do they shift the weight to more consistently? And then if I can show the person like they were unaware of that, they're like, whoa, really? Yeah. And then people have pain because they uh, do the same pattern over and over or they go against their pattern and discover which, so what do you do? Do you have more pain when you go into your pattern or do you have more pain when you go out of your pattern? And then you're on the road to discovery. So I, I mean, I, now I feel like, wow, it's so simple to work with people with pain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think that's fantastic because there are so many people and a lot of them are very silent. We don't even know that they're, that they're suffering chronic pain, but um, I think that's, that's fabulous. Thank you so much for that. Deborah, um, some of our listeners might be familiar with uh, Moshe's candle holder lesson. Um, and I'm aware that you've developed a, a special ATM series from Moshe's uh, Chinookia. I don't know if it, even if I'm pronouncing Anukia. that correct. Anukia. Anukia. Sorry, Anukia, Anukia. Mm -hmm. series. Um, can you tell us a bit about that, please? I, I yeah. did actually do that. I did one of the lessons earlier today and it was, yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, so Hanukia or Hanukia, I'm not, I have heard different ways of pronouncing it yeah. in Hebrew. It describes the candelabra. And so uh, I like, when I teach my awareness to movement class, I, I often like to teach lessons that are seasonal. Like I like to do the prayer lesson at, on New Year's, you know, I like to do um, on Valentine's Day, something that makes you feel your heart and just love, you know, touching yourself, all that stuff. So around Hanukkah time in December, I started with my private classes teaching like four or five Hanukkah lessons, Hanukkia, all based on using this position, right? So if I'm on my, here comes my other cat. Oh, how beautiful. <laughs> so they like the on, lessons as well, probably. Yeah. <laughs> so if I'm lying on my back, uh, my hands are going to be like this, right? So like, yeah, so I'm lying on my back, my hands are towards the ceiling. And um, Moshe really just teaches one lesson of that. But by playing with the variables, mm -hmm. you can develop that into a huge series. So I've developed it into, I mean, I probably could teach 10 or 11 lessons based on that. Um, some of, for the Feldenkrais practitioners here, some of them also could go to uh, rolling the fists, right? Rolling fists are part of, can be part of the Hanukkia lessons. Um, the other series that's in Amherst, uh, Egyptian Arms, can be part of that series. So I just took like the basic thing, moving the arms, lifting the head, all of that stuff. And then each week would add another level of complexity. And then I discovered that 
What's mm -hmm. really super fun about that series is by the end, then you can start playing with all the variables. So one variable is the head turning, one variable is the arms turning, one variable is the legs turning. And then you can ask people to do one way and then change one variable without getting anxious, without holding the breath, without increasing the strain or the stress. And then you have this experience that I described earlier of your brain exploding, right? You just, <laughs> you can't control it. Um, so that's the series, how I've developed it. And I'm teaching it, um, oh, starting this Friday, uh, one lesson. And then I'll do one lesson every day during the first uh, week of Hanukkah. Hanukkah's uh, eight days, but we're only doing five lessons in Hanukkah and plus one free. Mm -hmm. And are those, are those lessons available online? So I have been fortunate to work with uh, movementandcreativity.com, Tiffany Sankari's uh, site. So she hosts it and organizes it. And that's where you can find them, movement and the word and creativity.com. Oh, so that's right. there. And then also on that site, I mean, if you want to know what I have, my two pelvic floor courses, I have touching self touch. I have um, some pain stuff. I have a mind mapping. Mind mapping is another one of my loves. I have a mind mapping how to mind map workshop. I might have something else, but I can't remember at the moment. <laughs> you've, you've had so many, you know, it's over 30 years of experience that you've got and you've right. been able to create, you know, you're able to create from one lesson, all these other lessons. So I'm really interested after having all this time, I understand that you're now closing your personal practice. Is that correct? Yeah. So the end of the chapter? Yeah, it's the end of a chapter of private practice. So I'm closing because with COVID, first last year, we had to close our center because COVID just, we couldn't do it. And so I have another little room that I share with some acupuncturists and a homeopath. We have a little center and um, you know, I'm turning 70 and I just decided that I wanna do something. Uh, someone gave me this term rewirement instead of retirement. So I'm going to rewirement and I really hope during my rewirement that I will finally like take everything out of my file cabinet and do the pelvic floor book. That's one of my goals. I'll be teaching at Saybrook University movement modalities for wellness. I'll be teaching online and I will be uh, whenever training programs are in person again for next year, I have a, a job in Canada and in um, New Mexico. And then, you know, some other jobs further down. So I'll be busy. I'm just needing a break. And my body physically, you know, FI is physical. And um, I'm only working two days a week, but I can really do well. Three lessons, four is okay. And if I do five, I end up getting really bad pain in my legs and spasms yeah. in my legs. So even with perfect self-use, not perfect, but really good self-use, it's just too much compression through my spine. Um, yeah, so that's a big change. Yeah, so even though you're um, closing down, you're still expanding in lots of ways. <laughs> yeah. driving, um, I'm rewiring. So, yes. Yeah, I love that term. <laughs> um, so for people that are new practitioners or practitioners that are out there, I'm sh um, would you have some advice? Um, you know, what are the challenges that you maybe, the, the, the speed pumps that we can avoid that you might be able to assist us with? Yeah, so I would say that if you finish a training and you can get through giving lessons, you know, with people looking at you, you can do anything. Like, you know enough already, you know more. I knew absolutely, I mean, really absolutely nothing when I finished my training. Like someone would come with a hip problem and I would look at their hip. I mean, I didn't even look at the whole body. So the main thing is to use your own curiosity, to be totally curious, not to get caught up in the diagnosis and not to try to fix or help people, but teach them, teach them what you know about yourself. So for me to be successful, you have to have a ton of curiosity. You have to do a lot of your own self-practice and the ability to learn independently. 
So when I finished my training and many, all the people at my level, we had no resources. We had no transcripts. We had nothing. We had the little ATM book. That was it. Yeah. And I took no notes during my training because they said, don't take notes. You don't need it. I thought, okay, great. I won't take them. I wish I did, but, um, and then all these other materials started showing up. So I personally, I think the Alexander Yanai materials are unbelievable. There's such a wealth. If you go through them and I, when I was using them, I was like, why did he put this step in? What is this? Why is this here? What does this get you? Why does he ask these questions? So I would like literally interrogate these ATM lessons to try to learn about how Moshe thought, because he said also, you can't do Feldenkrais until you think differently, right? Until you think differently. So all, everything's there in his Alexander and I lessons, how he thought. And if you can't figure those out, then get together with a colleague, but you don't really, you don't really need a lot more training. You've got it. You've really got it. And that's what I see as the problem with a lot of practitioners. They're too scared to practice. I, I was never scared because I needed the money. <laughs> and you know, if you don't need the money, you're not going to really be motivated, but every it's like for my level, everybody I know who was successful needed the money. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, that was a great big motivator. Like I knew when I finished my training, I want to do this work. I don't know how to do it, but I remember the first time someone walked in my office towards me, I had been practicing doing something anyway, that called looked like practice for five years. This person walked towards me and I was like, Oh my God, I see the whole pattern. And I just wanted to tell them like, you can't imagine what I see your shoulders. Your... So, um, yeah, just practice. And use the, um, I think some of the lessons that are so important to have, develop your own reference system for seeing movement are the primary image lessons, which are in Alexandria and I, there's diagonal image, primary image. Uh, uh, they're all, I think it's 434 or something like that. But yeah. there's a whole bunch of lessons that are around the primary image. The line of the spine, the line of each arm and leg, the two points of the shoulders and the hips, the diagonals, you know, the Leonardo da Vinci thing. That those lessons, once I saw those, and I remember calling up Dennis Leary and saying, Dennis, have you seen these lessons that just came out? And Dennis then loved them also, and he called them the primitives. So if you've ever done the primitives. But um, yeah, they... They really just give you your reference. You need a reference system so you know what you can see. So that's what I think takes. Uh, and then reflecting on what you did, like writing notes afterwards, like, oh, I saw this, or I don't know what. I mean, how many times do you listen? You don't know what the heck you're doing. Like, that's so what? Yeah. If you touch the person with the quality, you're going to learn from that. Like, just like that quality of touch, really using that is really important. Thank you. You've, I'm so grateful for you sharing our, that journey, your journey over the last <laughs> year in that this time. So you've you've talked about you really started in the Feldenkrais house, you know, with Dennis and Mark and David. And I, I it's really interesting for me that it was flexible minds that drew you into this process. It wasn't about the body. Mm -hmm. um, so as you want, weren't want, wanting conscious control, you just wanted a new experience of thinking. And you really use your own drive, your own curiosity and your own personal um, issues to then delve into it. Um, I love how you say I love working with people with chronic pain because I, I assume most people it's just a doorstop, you know, it's just a complete roadblock. Um, and it is simply like you said, we've got the tools. You've, it's been really nice to hear. We've, if we know Feldenkrais, we know what to do because we just have to stay in the process and we just have to be curious and then we can we can do this just like you had and <laughs> that's we're so, yeah we're so glad about your rewirement we're looking forward to what we can um enjoy from that process from from where you go so thank you so much deborah um so as deborah said at movement and creativity.com are some lessons and some series that she's created like the pelvic flora shims there um, public health and then your actual own website is www.feldenkrais then the letters sf.com 
and you've got some lessons there, videos and articles, and obviously you can get in touch with Deborah Bass there. So thank right. you so much. We loved your journey. You. It was yeah. great to share it with you. Mm -hmm. Thank Deborah. you. It's been wonderful. I could, I could talk to you for weeks. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great.